Vince Cerf will be speaking at the press club today. He's Google's chief internet evangelist and one of the people widely recognized as being a co-founder of the internet. He's being introduced right now by the president of the National Press Club. The Advanced Research Projects Agency was the earliest version of the internet. One of those involved in the demonstration that day is today's speaker. Since then, in 1972, Vince Cerf has developed and advanced the architecture and utility of the internet, ushered the continued spread of the web, and become one of the most widely respected authorities on internet policy and governance. Many call him a father of the internet. Since 2005, Dr. Cerf has served as the chief internet evangelist for Google. He says he took that moniker because they wouldn't approve the title of Archduke. <laughs> Dr. Cerf is obviously well versed on the value and capabilities of the internet. Recently, he voiced concern that the 21st century could become an information black hole unless we find ways to preserve photos, documents, and other digital content, which is hard because we don't know how computers of the future will function. His solution for now? If you want to make sure that some important information survives for posterity, print it out. <laughs> Dr. Cerf's current project is the Interplanetary Internet, which he is working on with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It is exactly what it sounds like, a computer network for planet-to-planet -planet communication. His list of awards and commendations is, as you can imagine, quite lengthy. If you want to learn more about them, you'll just have to look them up on the internet. Google it. <laughs> Please give a warm National Press Club welcome to Google's chief internet evangelist, Vint Cerf. Well, first of all, thank you very much. This is theorem number 208, which reads, if you feed them, they'll come. And here you are, and I'm here too, so it's my favorite theorem, and I'm glad we proved it again. Uh, second, I'm not going to use any presentation charts or anything. My motto is power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. So <laughs> you'll have to just listen to Vint instead. Um, I did want to tell you a little anecdote, which I think is relevant to especially this population. Uh, I worked on something called MCI Mail way back in the 1980s. We turned it on on September 27, 1983. And among the first people to sign up for this electronic mail service were reporters, one of whom was William F. Buckley. And I maintained a lovely correspondence with Bill over uh, the time before he passed away. And I remember that uh, I uh, had come and gone uh, to, to MCI, built MCI Mail, left to join Bob Kahn at CNRI, and then rejoined MCI to help them get into the internet business. And around 2003, it was very clear that charging people for email uh, wasn't exactly a great business model anymore. So we shut down uh, the MCI Mail service, and I got a whole bunch of angry emails from reporters who said, I've had my MCI Mail address since 1983, how can you do this? But the honest answer is that it was time uh, for that service to go. So I have two themes that I would like to address this afternoon. The first one has to do with technology, and I will drop into geek a bit. I apologize, but it's the only way to, to be precise. And then I want to talk a little bit about policy. So I have eight uh, points or so on the tech side and four or five points on the policy side. So let me start on the technology side. I'm really proud of the fact that the internet continues to evolve. This is not a design which was fixed in time 40 years ago, but rather it's one which has adapted to new technology, it has swept in new communications capability, it has become an important element of the smartphone, both of the internet and the smartphones and the World Wide Web are all mutually reinforcing. Uh, in many, many ways. So one of the things that Bob and I didn't quite get right was the amount of numerical address space that's needed in the internet. When we designed it 40 years ago, uh, we did some calculations and estimated that 4.3 billion terminations ought to be enough for an experiment. And so the version of the network that most of you are using is called IP version 4 or TCP IP version 4, which was designed back around that time. Well, we got it wrong. We ran out of the uh, IP version 4 address, experimental address space around 2011. 
the, uh, the CEO of Aaron, the America's Registry for Internet Numbers, is right over there. John Curran, you can wave at them. So if you need IP addresses, he's the guy to talk to about that. Uh, I'm proud to serve as chairman of the board of Aaron. But we need IPv6 now, which has 128 bits of address space. I'll do the math. It's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. This is a number only the Congress can appreciate. Um, <laughs> But it is absolutely vital that we get all of the ISPs to turn IPv6 on. The software is in your laptops and desktops and mobiles. It's in the routers. But the internet service providers need to turn that on in parallel with the IP version 4 service, which many of you are using today. So you can do me two favors. One, as individuals, talk to your ISPs and demand an answer. When am I going to get IPv6 addresses? I want dates and times. And second, as reporters, will you kindly do the same thing, but do so with the megaphone that is afforded to you by the fourth estate. Now, why do I care about having lots more IP addresses? Well, one answer is that the next wave of stuff is the Internet of Things. You all know that. Uh, but this is real. Every appliance that you can possibly imagine is shifting from electromechanical controls to programmable controls. And once you put a computer inside of anything, there's an opportunity to put it on the net. Now, there are good things and bad things about that. The good thing about the internet is everything is connected. The bad thing about the internet is everything is connected. So uh, we really need the address space in order to accommodate this explosion of devices. Cisco says that there may be 50 billion devices by 2020. And you know, they may not be as crazy as it sounds because uh, every light bulb could potentially have its own IP address. Some of them already do, like the light bulbs that are made by Philips called Hue, H-U-E, not H-U-G-H. You can control the color and the light intensity from your mobile. And to do that, you need an internet address. So we need to get IPv6 implemented. That's the first technology point. The second one is even more obscure. The label is buffer bloat, and you might think, okay, so what is this? When you're watching streaming videos, have you ever noticed that sometimes they get real jerky and things slow down and the, the delays are going up and you sit there waiting for things to reload? Well, it turns out that it is not true that having more buffer memory space is always a good thing. Let me explain. You have a router at home, typically. Maybe it's supplied by a cable or telco company, or maybe you bought one and installed it, uh, or you hired a geek to do that. And so this thing has memory in it. And imagine for a moment that you're running a local network at home and it's running at maybe 100 megabits a second or maybe 10 megabits or maybe even a gigabit per second. But the connection that you have out to the rest of the world is not running that fast. Unless you happen to be on one of the Google Fiber networks, in which case you're getting a gigabit per second. But most of them don't quite get that at speed. So what happens? The program that you have running in your, inside the house is pushing data like crazy into this buffer, which is filling up and emptying slowly because the data rate on the other end is slower than the rate at which you're pumping it in, which means that there is increasing amounts of delay from the standpoint of the sender over here, waiting to hear acknowledgments coming back from the other end. At some point, the program inside your house is saying, oh my god, they didn't get what I sent. I better send it again. And so you keep retransmitting, pretty soon you create a highly congested condition. So it's counterintuitive, but what you have to do is to design the system so that it doesn't put too much buffer space in the path. It should put only enough to deal with the differential between the high speed and low speed side. Of course, this also works in the other direction. So there is, here's the code word for you. The, the, the letters that you want to refer to are called CODEL-FQ, C-O-D-E-L-FQ, and that is the kind of thing, that's the technology that you want in your routers. So you can, while you're pounding on the table for IPv6, you could say, and also, by the way, I want CODEL-FQ in my router, and I want a pony. Okay. <laughs> Next point. Uh, all of you are familiar with the fact that we're really bad at picking passwords. And some of us still use password for passwords because that's easy to remember, but everybody else knows that, so that's not a good thing. So uh, you try to, you're told, you know, please make up complicated passwords with punctuation and other stuff and keep changing them all the time. And you can never remember them, so you make a list and you stick it on your computer or you, <laughs> or you put it in your wallet. Okay, so at Google, uh, you will remember, and some of you reported that we were attacked in 2010 
uh, and penetrated, and so we decided we needed to do something about that. So in addition to username and password, which we still ask people to change on a regular basis, we also have a piece of hardware. Uh, it's, it is called a Gnubby, G-N-U-B-B-Y, and don't ask me why, I have no idea. This little gadget is a two-factor authentication device. Essentially, it generates a random one-time password using a cryptographic algorithm. So when I log into my Google accounts, and you could do this too if you were using Gmail, when you log into the, the account, if you're asking for two-factor authentication, it will do one of several things. If you have this little device, you just tickle it because the light came on and it sends the data back and forth or it sends you a random number to your uh, mobile, or you have an algorithm running in the mobile that generates the random number for you. All of those cases imply you had to have this other thing, your mobile or the little Gnubby device, or, or uh, a message coming from Google giving you the latest one-time password, in addition to knowing your username and password. So that's why it's two-factor authentication. It means if somebody got your username and password for any reason at all, they can't, they can't get in because they don't have the second factor we would like to encourage everyone to adopt that practice because that will make the network safer for you and for me. Fourth point, security uh, is and safety and privacy are really important in the net and one way to achieve that in part is to use what's called HTTPS. Hypertext Transport Protocol is what Tim Berners-Lee invented back in 1989 and released that as part of the World Wide Web. There is a secure version of this, it's called HTTPS, and the purpose behind it is to encrypt the traffic between you, your laptop, desktop, mobile, tablet, and the server on the other end, Google in my case. And so the idea here is that everyone should be making use of this cryptographic means of transmitting data back and forth. So while you are using web-based applications, the information is kept in encrypted form and only decrypted when it uh, reaches the other end. So this is called in encryption uh, for, for transmission. Which leads me to the fifth point, which is that Google and others believe that all transmissions, regardless of whether it's from your edge device to our services or between our data centers or any other place, ought to be encrypted in order to protect confidentiality. And so we see uh, crypto as a very, very important um, technology which should be in incorporated into normal use on the net. I know I don't have very much time, so I won't tell you stories about how I worked with NSA way back in 1975 to design and build a secured internet. The only problem was that the details were classified at the time, and I couldn't share it with my colleagues. So I felt schizophrenic for a long time, but now we have the technology available to make this a much more confidential environment. We think also that it's important to encrypt data once it lands in place. So your laptops should be encrypted, your disk drives should be encrypted, your mobile should be encrypted. Uh, we will encrypt data that lands in our data centers as we move it back and forth between the data centers. We keep it uh, encrypted so that even if the data center were penetrated or you lost your laptop or your tablet, the information will be very hard for someone to extract. So crypto is important. Uh, the seventh point is another geek thing. It's called DNSSEC. Now, you all know what the domain name system is because you use domain names all the time. DNSSEC is a security extension. How do I do this in a couple of seconds? Um, when you do a lookup of a domain name, you may not see that happening, but you're, when you type www.google.com, your computer says, where the hell is that on the net? I need a number. And it looks it up in the domain name system, which is a big distributed database. What it gets back is an IP numerical address. So these two pieces of information, domain name and IP address, are very important. Now, what happens if somebody can go in and change the numeric uh, address associated with the domain name. You may think you're logging into bankofamerica.com, but if somebody has hacked the system, you're off to some bad site which is extracting your username and password and everything else. So the solution to this problem is to use something called a digital signature. Some of you have heard the term public key cryptography. Digital signatures arise out of that technology. We can digitally sign the binding between the domain name and the IP address. So when you get that pair back from doing the query, you can check, did anybody change the binding? Has anybody altered the numerical part? And by checking the digital signature, you can verify it has not been modified. This protects against all kinds of spoofing kinds of attacks that would otherwise be uh, of harm. So we think DNSSEC should be implemented. It is being implemented uh, throughout the domain name system, but we need more and more implementation as it goes down into the hierarchy. The eighth thing on the geek side, you're going to love this. It's BCP38. 
okay, what the hell is that? This is best communications practices, um, number 38. Basically, what this says is that if you are a, operating a network and you are going to uh, accept traffic from people that will eventually be sent out to the rest of the internet, the first thing you should do is check to see whether the source internet address, the numerical internet address that's coming from whoever is giving the traffic, is coming from a legitimate source. Is it really coming from a network that owns that address space or is responsible for that address space? And so BCP38 basically says, don't let traffic into the net that has fake source addresses. It's possible to fake the source address by just stating, this is coming from that place over there, even though it's coming from here. We don't want people to do that. So we think, again, the ISPs should be executing this BCP38 thing. Uh, so you can tell that I have a very strong message, which I ask you to amplify, to tell the ISPs time to get on the stick to in improve the, the uh, safety, security, and confidentiality, confidentiality of the net. Okay, now we switch over to policy. And they told me they were going to tell me when this thing was going to die. What does it say? It says I have 19 minutes left? No, it says it's 19 after, so you've got... Uh, uh, Three and a half seconds. Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. <laughs> Okay, so eight things in seven minutes. Um, first of all, some of you, I hope, are reading about, and some of you may be writing about, this idea that NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Agency, has to transfer whatever responsibilities it still retains to the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. This is called the IANA transition, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority transition, so that the multi-stakeholder uh, bodies of the Internet, all of us, become part of the operation of, and of policy development for the internet rather than having a specific agency of the U.S. government taking responsibility for that. When the ICANN was created in 1998, that was the intent. There was supposed to be a two or three year period while everything settled down and then uh, NTIA, the then NTIA would then relinquish responsibility for any further direct interaction. Well, it's been uh, some years since 1998. It's now time, and NTIA has proposed to do that. It's asked the community to uh, show how it would operate without the benefit of this NTIA oversight. And so, uh, although there is controversy over this, I am a strong believer that we should step, the government should step away from this special uh, uh, responsibility or authority and return this to the community which is, has created and operated the internet since its inception. So that's point number one. Second, I can't imagine that you would disagree that freedom of expression and access to information is absolutely fundamental to our democratic societies, and we need to make sure that the internet continues to support that. I'd like to add one more freedom to this, and that's freedom from harm. We don't often speak about that, but unless people feel that they are safe in using the internet, then they will not use it. And if they don't, then some companies' business models, including mine, uh, may be, uh, very well be undermined. So it's very, very important in addition to the freedom of expression and assembly uh, and access to information that we do everything we can to protect people from harm, which is why I was talking about all those other geek things a little while ago. Point number three has to do with non-discrimination. And in particular, uh, none of the ISPs or the broadband providers should have anything at all to say about where the traffic comes from and where it's going. Everybody should have equal access to the net. You should have the ability to go anywhere you want to on the net and in principle, do whatever it is you want to do. Of course, if it turns out to be illegal, that's a different problem. But none of the providers of access to this system should be telling you what you can and can't do. So that's a non-discrimination element that's showing up in the net neutrality uh, uh, orders that have come from the FCC. Preserving user choice is fundamental, again, to the Internet's utility. Similarly, uh, the fourth item on the policy list is equal access to performance features. I mean, if you have the need for low latency because you're playing some kind of a video game or you need high bandwidth because you're streaming video, you should have access to that. There shouldn't be uh, it possible for the broadband provider to pick and choose who gets access to that and who doesn't. This should be openly available to everyone. I didn't say free, but what I said is everyone should have equal access to those capabilities. And finally, um, 
I think it's very important that we encourage, not only here in the U.S., but everywhere around the world, the adoption of policies that would encourage the creation of more internet. Now, of course, I'd say that. But look, here's my problem. Um, at Google, my job is to get more internet built all around the world. And in talking to uh, Eric Schmidt the other day, he said, you know, you can't retire. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, you're only half done. You have three billion people up. You have another four billion people to go. So I could use some help in case any of you are, uh, are interested. We really need to help countries recognize the importance of investment in internet infrastructure for the benefit of their citizens. And so that is my fifth and last point on policy. And since I am clearly over time, uh, I will stop there, Mr. Chairman, and turn the floor over to you to ask grilling questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. The internet was created by the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, and now it is global, yet no one really owns the internet. Is it possible that a multi-stakeholder governance environment can actually work? Boy, that was a nice gimme. Thank you for that one. I appreciate it. First of all, he's right. DARPA did sponsor this initially. The answer is absolutely yes, and how can I possibly prove that? Well. We turned the internet on on January 1st, 1983. Okay, do the math. How long ago was that? 1983. 32 years. Now, who do you suppose was actually running it at that point? It wasn't the Defense Department. I was sitting, uh, actually I'd left the Defense Department. I was off at MCI doing MCI mail at the time. But my colleagues were parts of universities. They were, uh, they were in the private sector running, building, and operating pieces of the internet. And it's been that way ever since. It has always been the private sector's role to build and operate these pieces. Of course the Defense Department has pieces of its own. So does the National Science Foundation and, uh, uh, let's see, NSF. So oh, NSF doesn't run the NSF net anymore. They actually started it in 1986 and then they shut it down in 95 because they didn't need it anymore because there were commercial services available. The private sector and the civil society and the technical community and the academic community and governments all have a responsibility, including you, to be part of the policy-making apparatus for the internet. The things that you do to protect your own safety and security and privacy affect me, too, because if you don't do a good job, then you become an avenue through which attacks can be made and you know, phishing attacks occur and access to things that shouldn't be uh, accessed by the wrong parties will happen. So we all have this shared responsibility to make policy decisions about the internet. The enforcement of policy could, could be the responsibility of specific organizations and individuals and the like, but the policy making things should be multi-stakeholder. And as far as I can tell, that has been working for the last 32 years and it can continue to work if you just let it. Next question. I've got several questions about hacking. And, uh, you know, the White House and the State Department have had networks hacked. Will there come a day when such hacks are not possible and someone else wonders who's responsible for cybersecurity? Who who's ultimately can stop the hacks from happening? So um, the, the answer lies in the previous response as well, because we are all responsible for improving the safety and security of the internet. Your own choices, your practices, the practices of the internet service providers are all part of this fabric that we have to maintain. Uh, there's a visual uh, model I have in my head of this. Imagine that you have a set of homes whose backyards are all shared, you know, so there's this big kind of a park and the front doors go out this way and the uh, going outward. And imagine that there's some nincompoop who insists on leaving his house unlocked. So even if everybody else locks the house, this one guy lets people into the interior. And that's a risk potentially for you. So I see the internet as having this character that we all have a role to play to make it more secure and safe. There are different um, places in the internet's architecture where attacks can be launched. So this is a very layered system. And so the mechanisms that might work at one layer may have no effect at another. I'll give you an example. Suppose somebody says, uh, the solution to uh, the email problem uh, is that we should encrypt everything. And, and so as long as we encrypt the email as it goes through the net, everything will be okay. Well, okay, let's analyze this a little bit. 
The source of the email is using a laptop which has become infected somehow. Maybe they plugged in a USB that was infected, or they stuck in a DVD, or maybe they went to a website that had malware on board. So this computer, which you don't know, uh, or this user doesn't know is infected, composes a piece of email which has malware in it. Then we encrypt it. It's great. So it goes all the way through the net. Nobody can see anything because it's all encrypted. It gets to the other end. It's decrypted. And that piece of malware now does its damage. So crypto at one level does not, what level does not necessarily solve all the problem. We have to put attack, we have to put um, prevention in various layers in the system using various and sundry technologies. So in a very, I mean, it's a kind of an oddball answer here, but it's sort of everybody's responsibility to do this. But each layer and each provider of service at those layers has a responsibility, just as we do at Google. We're way up in the application space. And we're doing everything we can to uh, protect against the kinds of attacks which could be launched against our layers of the architecture. But there are other layers below us, the ones that are doing transport, that also need to contribute to the safety of the system. Right now, we use social uh, and credit history to verify our legal identity. If social security numbers didn't exist, what would identity verification look like? And is there a better way to do identity verification? The short answer is yes. Would you like me to elaborate? <laughs> um, so first of all, social security numbers were not intended to be uh, identifiers used in commerce, right? But you know they are. Um, or the last four digits, which is almost worse. Second, the social security numbers don't have any check digits in them or anything. There's no way to tell whether this is a valid or invalid social security number. It's just nine digits. So uh, we could do a lot better, especially with today's technology. One possibility would be to issue um, as a certificate which identifies a public key that belongs to you and to you alone. And what you would want is to have the private key that goes with it. Now, this is public key crypto stuff. This is this weird thing that my friends Marty Hellman and Whit Diffie came up with in 1977. It's kind of like a door with two locks. You have two keys. One key locks the door, but it doesn't unlock it. The other key unlocks the door, but it doesn't lock it. And so you have these two different uh, cryptographic keys that work together to create uh, security. So you can imagine having an identifier uh, with a, uh, that has been digitally signed by an authority that would issue those identifiers. That authority could be a state government, because that's where the SSNs come from, or it could, well, I guess it's a federal government, but the states issue these things uh, by, does anybody know the answer to that? Is it correct that the states issue the social security numbers, but they do so on, uh, the federal government does it. Okay, thank you. Um, so the federal government could issue these certificates. And as long as the digital signature works, this is a way of validating yourself remotely. Somebody could send you a challenge saying, are you really Vince Cerf with this public key? And if they encrypt that in my public key, only I can decrypt it in my private key, just like the only guy who can unlock the door with the private key. And then I could send a response back to that party's, uh, using that party's public key to encrypt the response. So we can verify that each of us has a credential issued by the federal government that has a public and private key associated with it. It's more complex than that, but we don't have time to go into all the details. But that's the essence of what could happen. It would be a lot better. By the way, here's another opportunity for policy. If we could agree on an international basis about uh, the uh, bona fides that have to be shown before you get one of these credentials, then we might be able to make a digital signature as significant and as authoritative as a wet signature is today. But we have to agree on a global scale what bona fides have to be presented in order to get this um, authorizing digital uh, signature and certificate. I think that would be a really good thing to do because it would encourage e-commerce and would also give us some protection against the abuse of our uh, social security numbers. So that's the long answer. In addition to printing out our photos, what else should we as a society be doing to preserve information, that is, preserve our culture for future generations? So that's a great question. Uh, I really didn't say print everything, but uh, some people who are in the business of printing photographs decided that's what I said. 
uh, and you know you can't blame them. You know, it's, 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 you know, printed photography has has gotten kind of you know different from all the stuff that you see on Flickr and everything else. So here's the problem: um, every single day when you use software in your laptops or desktops and what have you. Uh, you create complex files. If you're using a text document editor, Microsoft Word or something else, the file that you create is actually a pretty complex object. And in order to correctly render it or allow the document to be edited, you need a piece of software to help you. That's the application program. So now, I want you to imagine that it's the year, you know, 2150, and you're Doris Kearns Goodwin's, you know, great-great-granddaughter, and you want to write about the beginnings of the 21st century. Now, you remember Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote that wonderful story about Lincoln and his team of rivals. If you read it, I hope you had the same reaction I did. The dialogue seemed very plausible. The opinions that were being stated and the words that were being used made it seem like she must have been a fly on the wall 150 years ago. Of course, she wasn't. She went to 100 different libraries and collected the physical correspondence of the principles and use that to reproduce the dialogue of the time. Now, imagine it's 2150, you're Doris Kearns Goodwin's great-great-granddaughter, and you're trying to write about the beginning of the 21st century, and you can't find a damn thing, because all the email has evaporated, or worse, you have these giant disks full of bits that represent the email, but the application program and the operating system it ran on, and the hardware that the operating system animated don't work anymore. They're gone. Nobody supported them. You have a pile of rotten bits on your hands. So I want to prevent that from happening. And there are only a few ways that I know of to do it. The best one that I have seen so far, I lectured about this with my partners at Carnegie Mellon uh, just last week at Stanford University. Um, this guy, Mahadev Satya Narayanan, I practiced so hard to say that. Um, <laughs> We call him Satya for obvious reasons. Uh, Satya has developed a virtual machine capability that will allow him to emulate hardware of pretty much any kind and then run the operating systems on that emulated machine and then run the application on the emulated operating system. And it works. He demonstrated this is not slideware. He showed 20 different emulations of different machines and different operating systems. And my God, he was showing me 1997 TurboTax running on a Mac. And it looked, you know, including the crappy graphics and everything else. It was, it was really a phenomenal performance. So the ability to preserve software applications and operating systems and emulate the hardware is exactly the best answer so far. Imagine running those emulations in the cloud so that those machines are available to anyone. This is not a trivial technical problem, and also there is intellectual property issues. How do I get a hold of the software? What rights can I get? What if I have the object code and I'm running it on the cloud, and somebody says, you can't do that because they didn't pay. And they said, it's 150 years since you did anything with that software. You know, give me a break. You remember what happened when the Xerox machines were created and the librarian said people should have the right to copy a limited amount of material this way and the publishers were saying, no, 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 people will, I'll publish one book and people will make Xerox copies of it and I'll never make any money. Well, that didn't happen and this ability to uh, employ fair use was very important. We need a preservation use like that associated with copyright so that preservation as an act is not only sanctioned, but encouraged so that our digital content will survive over long periods of time. That's my long answer to that question. I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. In 1979, Bob Kahn urged you to create a brain trust in case you got hit by a bus and couldn't continue your work. Who do you view as the brain trust today? And part two of that is do you feel there is enough technical expertise or even consultation with technology experts among those who craft technology policy. So who is the brain trust, and is the brain trust being consulted like it should in technology policy? Okay, so the answer to the last part is no. Uh, the answer to the first part is that the original group that I created at Bob's request was called the Internet Configuration Control Board, ICCB. We made it as boring as possible so nobody would want to be a member of that board. And then I appointed the people who were the lead researchers on the development of the internet at multiple universities around the US. 
And so the ICCB morphed into the Internet Activities Board around 1984, later became the Internet Architecture Board in 1992 when it became part of the Internet Society. And now the Internet Architecture Board and the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Research Task Force, all of which are housed in the Internet Society, uh, are the brain trust for the technical evolution of the Internet. That's where the bulk of the new protocols are coming from. This is not to disenfranchise uh, uh, various corporate uh, entities that are trying to uh, develop new protocols and new applications for the net, but the core of the Internet's evolution still comes from that brain trust. Um, I've lived here in Washington since 1976, and I've considered it to be a, both a privilege and a responsibility to try to uh, help policymakers understand enough about the Internet so the policies they make make some sense. And, you know, I'm not looking for technical depth here. I'm looking for simple cartoon models of how the network works that are accurate enough so if you reason with those simple models, you will reach the right kind of conclusions about what policies are implementable and which ones are not. I mean, the last thing you want is a policy that requires you to double the speed of light, for example, or you know, abandon the law of gravity. So uh, our job as technologists, I think, is to try to be helpful, uh, to provide clear enough explanations for how this stuff works so that when policy gets developed, uh, it actually is implementable and it makes sense. You know, the worst thing in the world is to pass laws that can't be enforced or can't be implemented because it, it encourages disrespect for the law, and that's not a good thing. Looking over the past two decades or so, what are the one or two developments in the Internet that you are most pleased with and most disappointed with? Well, starting with the last one, um, spam is a kind of a disappointment. <laughs> And I have to say, I'm very proud of my company at Google because we've done a very good job of filtering out an awful lot of spam. You know, if you happen to be using Gmail, if you ever looked at your spam folder, it's amazing how much stuff you didn't have to look at, especially, you know, how to enlarge body parts and all that stuff. So, uh, so that's a, a, it's an annoying side effect that email is essentially free. So it means the spammers don't get don't have to pay for what they do, and there are crazy ideas like you know charge 0.002 cents for every email. It's not enforceable, so forget that. So spam is annoying, but you know there are ways of filtering it out. Um, the the thing which I was most astonished by, I'm, I'm proud is a very funny word to use here. In fact, let me go down an alley for a moment. Some of you have kids, right? And it, uh, you might have learned what I learned, which is uh, don't um, take too much credit for when your kids do well, so when they screw up, you don't have to take too much blame. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, I, th I think that, uh, that you know, the, uh, proud is the wrong word to use about Internet. Uh, I'm just grateful to have been part of this story. However, uh, with regard to uh, surprises, when Tim Berners-Lee's World Wide Web showed up, uh, in 1989, nobody really noticed except Tim and some of his colleagues at CERN. But when the Mosaic browser showed up around 1993, uh, this was absolutely astonishing because it turned the internet into a magazine. It had imagery and color and had, you know, formatted text. And it was really quite eye-opening. On top of that, the browsers had this feature that if you wanted to see how the web page was built, you could ask the browser to show you the HTML, the hypertext markup language. So this was open. Everybody could copy everybody's web pages, and they did, and then they found new ways of making them more interesting. So this, you know, the webmaster was a, a kind of a role which didn't exist before the World Wide Web, and it was uh, sort of enhanced by the fact that everybody could share each other's web pages and how they were built. And so the thing that astonished me was the amount of content that poured into the net once the web browsers and HTML were available. It was just astonishing how much information people wanted to share, not because they wanted to be paid, but they wanted to know that their information was useful to somebody else. And so, you know, you hear this story about information is power. Nonsense. It's information sharing that's power, and we've seen it, and we've seen it over the past 20 decades, or 20 years, and we're going to see it over the next 20 years, maybe the next 20 decades, too. So the thing that I like the most about the Internet is that it is evolvable, it is scalable, it's well over a million times bigger than it was when we turned it on. There aren't too many protocols that will allow you to do that kind of scaling, uh, and it has invited creativity, 
We use the term permissionless innovation very deliberately. You don't have to get permission from every ISP in the world to invent a new product or a service and put it up on the net, and it should stay that way. This questioner says you are said to have been a candidate for the office of U.S. Chief Technology Officer. Uh, he wants to know if you would have taken that job, but really a larger question also is, would you consider moving over to the government side to help sort out some of these issues in some kind of senior role, if, if offered? Wow. So this is a hypothetical, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, so first of all, uh, the answer is there were news reports that I might have been on the list. I don't actually know. Um, but I consulted with some of my friends, including Eric. And Eric said, you know, why don't you just be the chief technology officer's best friend? <laughs> and so I made good friends with Anish uh, and with his successor, and of course, Megan, who's now there uh, as CTO. Uh, and I thought that was pretty good advice. Now, I have served in the government. I served six years at DARPA. I really enjoyed that time. It was an empowering moment for me. Uh, it was a period of time that um, where I worked with incredibly smart people. But my whole career has been that way. I mean, I'm at Google, surrounded by incredibly smart people, most of them smarter than I am. And I learn that every single day, especially when the 25-year-olds run over and say, why don't we do X for some value of X? And I'll sit here thinking, oh, we tried that 25 years ago and it didn't work. Then I have to remember that 25 years ago, there's a reason why it didn't work. And that reason may no longer be valid. It could be that computers are cheaper, they're faster, there's more memory, something else is economically feasible that wasn't before. I have been forced to rethink my own views on these things over and over and over again. And let me tell you, nothing keeps you younger than having to rethink your own positions instead of falling into a rut. So for me, I think, I don't feel the need to become part of the government, but I want very much to have an opportunity to provide support and help if I can, and I will do that if I am allowed. Do you want to see Congress pass the USA Freedom Act? And Congress just had a hearing on encryption focusing on privacy rights versus law enforcement's desire for a backdoor into cell phones, et cetera. What do you think Congress should do? Wow. So first of all, this backdoor idea is uh, indicative of an, a real tension here. I mean, this global system is used and abused, like a lot of technology. There isn't anything about the technology that determines whether or not it's a, a constructive or destructive use. It's just a neutral tool, and some people abuse it. And so we have to do something. I mean, uh, we wish to protect the citizens uh, of our country and others from harm in this network. And so you have to ask yourself, well, how can I do that? What steps can I take? And the tension, pretty obviously, is that if you use things like cryptography to protect privacy and confidentiality, which I'm sure every one of you cares about, there's this question about what about the legal law enforcement people and what can they do? And the proposal to put back doors into things is reminiscent of something else some of you will have reported on the clipper chip back in the 90s. I was absolutely adamantly against the clipper chip idea. And the reason was very simple. If you have a back door, somebody will find it. And that somebody may be a bad guy and, or bad guys, and they will intend, intentionally abuse their access. So creating this kind of technology is super, super risky. And so I don't think that's the right answer. Now, at the same time, I accept that governments are there in part to protect their citizens from harm. So the question is, how do you do that? And there is this, this spectrum. Imagine that on one end, we live in a society where there is no privacy at all. Everything is known. Everything you're planning to do is known. It might be a very safe society to live in, but it might not be one you want to live in. On the other hand, what about a society where there's absolute privacy, nobody knows what you're planning to do at all, and bad stuff happens? So you feel that your privacy is protected, but your safety has now been uh, uh, diminished. There must be some place in between, and it isn't the same place for everyone, it isn't the same place for every culture, and it isn't the same place for every nation. Our job in the US is to figure out where is that balance for us. And I think the Congress is, is forced now to struggle with that, and they're going to have to listen to these various arguments about protection and safety on the one end and preservation of privacy and confidentiality on the other. I'm not persuaded that building back doors is the right way forward. 
The way the FCC's Title II net neutrality rules are written, do you think they offer equal opportunity download speeds while forbearing enough Title II rules to avoid government overreach like new fees or content regulation? So this is a really interesting problem, and some of you have lived through this for a couple of decades. Um, I think that Tom Wheeler didn't have a whole lot of choice. The FCC had uh, asserted a set of um, neutrality rules which were intended to protect user choice. And they were uh, essentially told by the Supreme Court, you do not have the legal basis to enforce your network neutrality preferences. And so I think Wheeler had three possibilities. One, do nothing, in which case, the net neutrality notions to the extent that people agree that they are helpful and useful and preserve user choice uh, would simply not succeed because of the lack of uh, legal basis for FCC's enforcement. The second possibility would have been to get the Congress to create a new title in the Telecommunications Act specific to Internet. Now some of you will remember there was a Brand X decision. This is. The, the cable companies and the telephone companies were saying, we are not regulated the same way. This is correct. There's two different titles in the Telecom Act for dealing with these two entities. And yet they were both providing internet service. And the complaint was, we're providing internet service under different ground rules. This isn't fair. So the question is what to do. One possibility might have been get the Congress to adopt a, an internet title that was appropriate to the internet technology, the choice that was made instead was to treat internet as if it's just an information service that had no layered structure, it had no telecommunications component, it was just an information service, end of story. Well, that led to, uh, that's an unregulated title, and so the FCC uh, role was completely removed. Tom chose a third path, and that was to invoke the uh, Title II which had been, and the FCC had the authority, in my view, remember IANL, right? But I believe the, they had the authority to decide it was Title I. They have equal authority to decide, no, no, it's really Title II, but constrained significantly. So what's the issue here? Well, now they, under this current rule, they have a basis for taking action if they think that the neutrality rules have been violated. However, there is this potential uh, forward-looking risk what happens if some new FCC in some future game decides to in, uh, invoke all of the messy complexities of Title II, which were designed for a system for voice communication, which is a far cry from today's internet and probably very much a far cry from tomorrow's internet. So at some point, this tactic probably has to be readdressed so that we, if we're gonna do anything at all in the regulatory space, it needs to be tailored to a network, which I want to emphasize again, must still be evolvable. It must be possible to add new products and services to it. We should not constrain the network, uh, you know, simply in order to regulate it. We need to find a way to make sure that the network is fairly, treats you fairly, gives you adequate opportunity, incites competition, but at the same time allows the FCC to protect your interests. So that's where my head is. And I hope as a former Congresswoman that uh, you think I have managed to straddle this reasonably well. I mentioned in the introduction that at the National Press Club we fight for press freedom worldwide. And, yeah. part, and part of your job is evangelizing the internet worldwide. What do you say to governments and regimes who consider the internet a threat? And what can you do to try to shake that loose? I wish I could just say get over it, but that doesn't work. Uh, let's take, everybody picks on China, so I guess I'll do that too, but they are a good example of a tension. I actually have some sympathy for the Chinese government. You realize that there are 650 million Chinese on the internet now? That's like over a third of their, well, yeah, more than a third of their population, close to a half. And so this means that the Chinese government and the private sector there have been investing an enormous amount in building infrastructure for the internet. Fiber networks, they were very early on into the IPv6 space, by the way, you know, bang, bang. So, um, yeah, this is even better. So, so they have made this big investment. At the same time, they come from a long history of very authoritarian practices. 
And so they're you know, scared, frankly, about uh, this large population of people becoming unhappy. And if you study Chinese history, which I have not, I am told that the last seven times there was a major regime change in China is because it was preceded by a peasant rebellion. And looking at all the conditions throughout China, especially on the West, uh, you can appreciate that things are really, um, you know, uh, scary for the administration, even if they're trying to do the right thing, which is to make sure people are fed and housed and everything else. So my story is that the countries that are seeking authoritarian control over the internet will discover at some point that if they do that, they're shooting themselves in the foot. First of all, they're in potentially inhibiting the creativity of the population, which is what they need in order to improve GDP. Second, they may be inhibiting their ability to explore world markets. And I don't care what country you are, even if the US, the global economy is bigger than you are. Don't cut yourself off from access to it. The same message needs to get to the Europeans who are struggling with the digital single market, but you know, at the same time, maybe accidentally preventing themselves from participating in a global market and letting the global market participate in the European one. So my message has always been economic. It is in your interest, Mr. President, to invest in the internet, to keep it as open as possible, and to allow your creative population to make use of it. No country has a corner on creativity and invention. It's uniformly distributed throughout the population of the world. It's just that the people with these ideas don't always have the wherewithal and the support in order to explore those ideas. And I will give you as a concrete example of that, how many folks come from India to the Silicon Valley or Seattle or here and do spectacularly well. Their ideas were the same. It's just that they didn't have the investment infrastructure, the willingness to take risk that we have in the United States. And so we know that there are smart people out there with the possibility to improve their own GDP if the rules could be made similar to what they are here in the United States. We are almost out of time. But before I ask the last question, I'd like to remind everyone about some upcoming speakers. Lieutenant General Michelle Johnson, the first woman to lead the Air Force Academy, Great. will address a luncheon on Friday. The CEOs of American, Delta, and United Airlines will appear together at a luncheon on May 15th. What an opportunity. And Garrison Keeler, author and host of Prairie Home Companion, will address the press club on May 22nd. I would now like to present our guest with the greatest gift of all, the National Press Club mug, which you can treasure for decades. Mug shot. That is a mug shot. And now the... The, the final question, maybe we have uh, time for two, depending on the, how long your answer uh, is. How long my answer is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This question almost sounds like it could have come in over the internet. I'm not sure whether it did. This questioner says, you have fewer than 5,000 followers on Twitter, and you're not verified. What's up with that? <laughs> so I don't tweet all that much, just every once in a while. And, you know, I have better things to do. Uh, than, you know, and besides, I get more than enough visibility as it is. I don't need any more. I mean, I got stopped by, a hand, by two autograph guys, right, you know, as I walked in today. Uh, so the, and I don't know, the verification, what do you have to do to get verified? Send your blood type or something? We'll have to ask Twitter. Yeah, I don't know. I, oh, I remember asking the guy that started Twitter, he says, this is your title, Chief Twit. He didn't think that was very funny. You know? <laughs> Next question. Why isn't there a Nobel Prize in computing? Oh, I have an answer to And that. should there be one? Oh, well, you know, you'd have to ask Mr. Nobel, but he's long past. <laughs> this, the story, which may not be true, is that Mr. Nobel's wife ran away with a really good mathematician. And in consequence, Mr. Nobel told his uh, committee that under no circumstance will any branch of mathematics be recognized by the Nobel Prize. And unfortunately, computer science has tended to be associated with mathematics, understandably. So uh, we in that field uh, are not eligible for the Nobel Prize. 
we might be eligible for the Peace Prize, but, uh, but that's a real stretch because that's a very political kind of thing. There is, however, a prize that's offered by the Association for Computing Machinery, which was founded in 1947 in the US. It has now gone global. There is a Chinese and an Indian and a European council in addition to the one which oversees the whole global operation. I am former president of ACM. I'm still serving in that role until uh, the middle of 2016. Uh, and the prize is called the Turing Award, named after Alan Turing, whom many of you by this time will know from the movies that have been made. That prize is $1 million. It's funded by Google, uh, and we're proud to offer that through uh, ACM every year. Uh, and I did get that prize along with Bob Kahn in 2004. So I feel more than adequately uh, compensated. It wasn't a million dollars back then, and they aren't doing it retroactively. I asked, <laughs> but that didn't work. Uh, so it is highly, it's, it's a, a coveted and, uh, and very high recognition of contribution to the computer science community. I think that's more than enough. How about of a round of applause for our speaker? Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank National Press Club staff, including its Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center, for organizing today's event. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.